All right. So tonight I want to talk about equanimity, which <clears throat> is very relevant to the waves of life that rattle us in our home environment or in our work environment. And also when we look out into the wider world, uh, the neighborhood in which we live, uh, city, community, nation, the, even the planet altogether, a lot of stuff going on. You might have noticed, including recently, and those waves also can really can really rattle us. So I want to uh, explore this topic with you. I won't particularly relate it to anything societal, um, you know. I, I but I th I think that the underlying stability and open heartedness and spaciousness and and underlying resilience that we can acquire through equanimity are certainly very relevant to concerns people may have about their, their country as a whole. I'd like to set this up by reading uh, five pa brief passages uh, from the Buddhist teachings, and then I'll talk a bit about equanimity grounded in our brain. Then I'll talk about kind of what it feels like in a very experiential way, and then suggest a few practices for the cultivation of equanimity over time, and then open it up for discussion. Uh, so it's a lot, of, a lot of good stuff, I hope. Here we go. So, five quotations. First, whose mind is like rock, steady, unmoved, dispassionate for things that spark passion, unangered by things that spark anger. When one's mind is developed like this, from where can there come suffering and stress? Passion, anger may still move through, but one is not swept away by them. And when that's the case, from where can there come suffering and stress? Second, a quality that one finds with equanimity and a factor of equanimity, abiding in the present. As the Buddha taught, they do not lament over the past, they yearn not for what is to come. They maintain themselves in the present, thus their complexion is serene their expression, or as I say to adolescents, even their complexion, because stress is inflammatory and it'll give you pimples. Okay. We do this practice for ourselves. We also do it for the sake of others, because as in the third quotation here, as the Buddha taught, if one going down into a river, swollen and swiftly flowing, is carried away by the current, how can one help others across? Through the cultivation of equanimity in ourselves, we become more able to help others in general, period, as well as help others who are swept away in the moment by their own reactions. One aspect of equanimity is uh, about what is pleasant or desirable that we might want to chase after, in addition to those aspects of equanimity that are about um, being more balanced, more like having inner shock absorbers when things are unpleasant, when stuff comes along that seems outrageous or really angers you or frightens you, makes you anxious. Certainly that's an aspect of equanimity and how we manage our reactions to what is unpleasant. But then there's equanimity as well necessary in our reactions to what is pleasant especially for people, as I do, living a householder life amidst all the, all the potential delights and distractions and addictions even that are available to us. So as the Buddha taught here in this fourth quotation, wonderful it is to train the mind so swiftly moving, seizing whatever it wants. Good it is to have a well-trained mind, for a well-trained mind brings happiness. It's it's certainly all right, this is the Buddhist teaching of the middle way, to enjoy the pleasures that pass through without turning them into things that we then try to hold on to and, and identify with, my precious, right? That's where trouble begins. And then last, fifth quotation, really relevant to all of this, both as a factor of equanimity and as a fruit of equanimity in this fifth quotation here. With good will for the entire cosmos, cultivate a limitless heart. 
above, below, and all around, unobstructed, without hostility or hate. So with that, um, and speaking to a question from Nadine in the chat, and just to remind people, if you're in the chat, be nice. <laughs> um, focus on your own practice. Try to, if there are react, if people, other people share things uh, that you, you don't particularly care for, you, you can just let your eyes keep moving, actually. Uh, and however you like, you know, try to steer clear of criticizing or advising others and focusing, again, on your own practice, your own experiences. What's it like to be you? In any case, as I believe, um, let's see, Nadine's comment, what are the translations? I'm reading translations from Pariyati, P-A-R-I-Y-A-T-T-I. -I. I get a weekly quotation from, pardon me, I get a daily quotation from them for free. Um, and it's based on their their translations from the from the Pali. Uh, there are other translations that slightly nuance things differently sometimes. Sometimes there's an important word that can be translated in a different way, perhaps. Uh, in my book, Neurodharma, uh, in the back are a lot of reference notes having to do with how various uh, translations come from and why I made the choices I did and alternative phrases sometimes even for key translations. But Pariyati is wonderful. I, I donate to them every year and you might want to do that as well. And it's a really great source for, for getting some, you know, your daily wisdom, typically four short lines, ba boom. Okay, so that's where this is from. All right, so now I want to talk about uh, in the, it kind of maybe the emotional sense, you know, the feeling of what I just explored with you. Uh, what is equanimity like in the brain? All right, and there's a lot of complexity here because the three pounds of tofu-like tissue inside the coconut is very complicated with about 80 billion neurons and about another 100 billion or so support cells. Typical neurons are connected with each other at several thousand places, several thousand synapses, giving us a network inside our head with several hundred trillion little microprocessors, those synaptic junctions, sparkling away, complicated. To simplify some of it, uh, think of three sort of major networks or circuits inside your brain operating right now, live, as I talk about all this. First, an attentional system that tries to stay focused on certain things and is also biased to pay attention to particular things. Somewhat based on life history, somewhat based, somewhat the bias, somewhat based on one's personal temp temperament. Some people, for example, temperamentally have attentional systems that tend to be biased toward looking for opportunities, looking for experiences, or things that could be promoted. Other people, other newborns, tend to have attentional systems that are more biased toward, that are more selective. You know, they're they, they tend to filter out and they tend to let in that which is uh, threatening, that which is to be prevented rather than promoted. This is all perfectly normal and we could certainly do both, but there are these biases that can be innate and then life comes, you know, for better or worse. And then our attentional systems tend to be biased um, in ways that are shaped by those life experiences. And we can bias our attention through deliberate top-down influence that says, for example, tonight, okay, whatever else is going on, let's try to stay with what Rick's talking about here at least 80% of the time, <laughs> you know, maybe even more. Uh, okay, so there's an attentional system. And second, there's what's called the salience network. Systems in the brain, parts of the brain, uh, that draw upon, in particular, the amygdala and other portions of the brain in what's called the subcortex that began emerging over 200 million years ago. They're sort of the middle floor of the three-floor house of the brain built from the bottom up over 600 million years of evolution of the nervous system. And in these subcortical regions, also somewhat biased and tilted one way or another by more recent parts of the brain, there's a continual tracking of why does this matter? Why bother? 
What's this got to do with me? Do I like it? Do I not like it? What's personally relevant about whatever stimulus is occurring around me, whatever is the setting I'm in, or whatever is bubbling up inside my own being? What's relevant about it? Salience network. This salience network is also biased one way or another. It tends to be biased uh, in evolution to be particularly attentive to what could be threatening rather than what could be opportunistic. Yeah, it's interested in what the opportunities are, but it's especially interested, understandably, in what could be threatening, especially some kind of a mortal threat or a threat to something that's really, really valuable. This is an example of the negativity bias of the brain, which can make it, as I say, more like Velcro for bad experiences and like Teflon for good ones. So that's the salience network. Uh, there are other ways to tilt it, to prime it or bias it through somewhat through temperament that's innate and also through training and, and life experience and also some top-down executive influences that tell us to, for example, remember that in the present day, if it's true, we're not necessarily so threatened as we actually were growing up, let's say, in pretty bad situations per, of any kind, poverty, our family system, bullying kids in school, to remind ourselves, you know, I don't need to go through life so armored, so on pins and needles about what bad thing could happen next. You know, I can take that into account, watch out for red lights, watch out for mean people, but still I can keep looking for and find relevance in uh, that which is an opportunity or a possibility of a positive connection with other people. Okay, salience network. And then there's a third system, the executive network, tend to be more associated with the third floor of the house of the brain, the neocortex, um, uh, evolving over time, but certainly in the last, in particular, last couple million years, uh, sort of the seat of top-down regulation. And so this part of the brain can, can guide us. For example, it can say, whoa, I'm having a really intense reaction to this other person. And honestly, I can recognize that it's way out of proportion to what they did. My reaction maybe is turbocharged by the fact that I'm hungry, maybe I'm tired, maybe I'm lonely, uh, maybe I'm irritated by something else. Uh, you know, I, I, can, I can manage my reactions here. All right. So you see, we have these three systems that are interacting with each other moment by moment by moment to make us not very equanimous or more equanimous. The ways in which we bias our attention or guide our attention can shape how we react to things. Uh, naturally, uh, to help us live to see the sunrise back in the Serengeti Plains, uh, back in Jurassic Park, uh, naturally, when anything happens that we find unpleasant or problematic, we tend to narrow attention down upon it. So one way to help ourselves continually is to deal with the bad, certainly, but also turn to the good. That's also true. Not to ignore the bad or paper it over, but in fact to actually help us cope with it better as well as appreciate what is factually good, broadly defined, outside us and inside us, and then certainly take in the good. We can direct our attention in that way. We can regulate it. And in so doing, we can then be less reactive and less primed to be reactive to bad news in terms of our attentional systems. Similarly, in terms of the salience network, personal relevance, we can gradually train it over time to be less prickly, less quickly reactive, and uh, more, you know, kind of calmer over time with repetition, with meditation, with many, many experiences of turning to the good and taking in the good, and certainly doing things to deal with the bad, as it is real in your life and out in the world. But over time, the salience network can be guided to a place that's, that's less reactive initially in its intensities, and also uh, finding salience, finding relevance in the bigger picture. In so many things, that are basically going on okay, if they are. This is not about positive thinking 
We need to track what's really problematic. We also need to track when there's a major opportunity that we're about to miss out on and we need to we need to keep going for it. We need to pursue that. Okay. But meanwhile, in most people's lives, most of the time, there's a lot of wallpaper. There's a lot of other stuff happening. Flowers that are blooming, clouds that are passing, people who are basically okay, people who are helping, things that are still working, water that is still coming out of faucets, um, you know, food that is still available in your pantry. When that's true, well, of course, appreciating that this is far from the case for many, many people, unfortunately, sometimes tragically. And still, we can help ourselves continue to make relevant what we tend to tune out. In other words, what is what is relatively constant or relatively you know, reoccurring, we tend to tune it out. We habituate to it. It loses relevance to us. And what tends to grab attention and seem personally relevant is breaking news, which we're kind of flooded by these days from all quarters. So in this way as well, we can train this salience network to be more balanced and more aware of the whole rather than getting continually sucked into uh, the loud and insistent parts. And then certainly in the executive systems, this is a real field of opportunity in part because technically as we go down physically in our own brain, as we go down what's called the neuroaxis, we go back in time. We, go, we start engaging more and more ancient systems, certainly in their origins, even if they are present with some modifications and tuning in the modern human brain today. Still, we tend to go back in time. And as we go down the neural axis and we go back in time, as for example, we start trying to teach <laughs> subcortical systems, let alone brainstem systems, as we try to train them and help them you know, heal and grow, Whew, they're slow learners. Neuroplasticity decreases as you go down the neural axis and back in time. That means that the more recent neocortex, neocortex rather, and um, the you know the seat of executive functions, these third the third network I'm talking about here, is a more of a field of opportunity for learning if we're deliberate about it. And so we have opportunities again and again to develop um, greater equanimity and develop factors of greater equanimity, for example, in how we talk to ourselves. That's a deliberate process uh, much of the time. We can talk to ourselves in deliberate ways that are skillful and proportionate to what's actually happening. And we can talk to ourselves in ways that give us guidance, including guidance where there's correction to put in, lessons to learn, but without harsh, punitive, beating ourselves up or allowing internalized voices of others that we've acquired over the years to beat ourselves up. That's an example of using these executive networks to foster equanimity. We can put things in perspective. We can remind ourselves that this really unpleasant experience or this totally messed up situation, I was trying to print something out during the break so I could come in and read these quotes and my printer was not talking to my computer. <sighs> just talking to yourself and reminding yourself, it's just a printer. It's okay. You know, it's in, it's, it's not that big a deal. It's a passing event, even if it's pretty horrible. <sighs> That's how we talk to ourselves. So we can engage executive systems that promote equanimity. And over time, we can draw on these executive systems as the Buddha taught to have growing insight into the structural generic processes of our minds so that we start to have uh, an increasing insight into the impermanence and the insubstantial nature of all experiences, insubstantial, kind of foamy, compounded, uh, or you know, in some sense, the ownerlessness of our experiences. They arise, they're here, pleasant, unpleasant, enjoyable, not enjoyable, they come and they go. You know, we can deepen in that insight. So in real time, we are rested increasingly in that insight, which gives us a disengagement from, and a disidentification with. We decrease our selfing of 
experiences we're having at the time so that they trouble us less. Yes, the wave is here, and the wave passes on by without me hopping on board it and trying to surf it into some happier destination. Okay, so that's a bit about the underlying neurobiology of equanimity. I can see questions and comments popping up in the chat. I'm going to promote my own equanimity by, these are not the droids you're looking for. <laughs> just going to let them go right on by just for the moment to keep on going here uh, and to preserve time to, for, for getting into the questions and comments that have come up. So now to the feeling of equanimity. And I want to highlight three qualities of it that are, as psychotherapy says, experience near. They're kind of close to our experience, I think. <clears throat> the first is that equanimity is spacious. There's a spaciousness to it. It feels spacious, and spaciousness supports equanimity. That sense of recognizing the context of everything, including the whole context of a relationship or a situation or a difficulty to get a printer to talk to a computer. What's the larger context? What's the larger whole? Move out into the space of it. A sense of the bird's eye view, that's spacious. A sense of the mind as spacious, as a kind of a spacious field through which experiences may pass. Sky of mind through which clouds pass, pardon me. Also a feeling in your body of your body as a whole, a sense of you know, your body as a whole, and then your mind as a whole. I talk about this a lot in the fourth of seven practices in the Neurodharma book, being wholeness, neurologically, and this speaks to a question that or someone raised earlier. Uh, neurologically, when we get a sense of things as a whole, we start disengaging from midline regions of the cerebral cortex, uh, including the default mode network toward the back, where a lot of not equanimous, negative reactivity originates and perpetuates. But when we go into a sense of things as a whole, activity there tends to quiet, activity in networks on the sides of the brain, notably the right hemisphere, the right side for right-handed people, switch for many left-handed people probably, uh, in which we just get a sense of things as a whole, which quiets all that kind of fussing and feuding in those uh, midline networks. So there's a sense of spaciousness. And I really want to draw your attention in your meditation or even in your life to a sense of space between you and, and something that's irksome. There's research that shows that as we get a sense of growing physical distance between ourselves and a stimulus, stress and emotional and negative emotions tend to decrease. So getting a sense of spaciousness and dealings with others Stepping away from a problem for a moment to remind yourself of a kind of space between you and it, and then coming back to it. And this is commonplace advice. And now we're increasingly understanding what the underlying neurobiological basis is of why these methods work. Getting a sense of spaciousness in your own mind, uh, edgelessness in the field of awareness, because you can't mark the boundaries of awareness, therefore it's boundless. Uh, opening out in all directions spaciousness. Equanimity is spacious. Second, equanimity um, includes peacefulness, contentment, and love. Equanimity is not inert or numb, apathetic, cold. To be able to be equanimous, there must, in the core of our being, be a felt sense of an enoughness, even biologically, of are the meeting of our three primary needs for safety, satisfaction, and connection. Otherwise, without that sense of uh, fullness and balance in the meeting, as it is for an individual, in the meeting of those needs, and instead, if there's a sense of something important that's missing or something that's disturbed, something missing, something wrong in the meeting of those three core needs, understandably, biologically, the animal that we all are moves into forms of craving, forms of fear, frustration, loneliness, resentment, ill will, drivenness of one kind or another. So in equanimity, as a fruit of equanimity and a factor of equanimity, as you've heard me probably teach about, it's really useful to 
rest increasingly in what I call the green zone, in which you, of course, interact in the world as best you can to actually address real problems in the meeting of your, of your needs. But meanwhile, when you do have an opportunity to feel a, an enoughness of needs met, you deliberately help yourself kind of marinate in, not out of clinging, but out of wise cultivation, wise support for your own practice, help yourself kind of marinate in the felt sense of peacefulness. In other words, an enoughness of safety, contentment, an enoughness of satisfaction, and love, an enoughness of connection. So, in equanimity, or equanimity includes a sense of peacefulness, contentment, and love. And you can explore peacefulness, contentment, and love as objects of meditation, not getting caught up in getting attached to them, not getting complicated about it, returning to the felt sense of peacefulness, contentment, and love as factors of equanimity that can become increasingly internalized and established inside yourself as traits. The last thing I'll say about equanimity is that it is engaged and adaptive. Equanimity enables us, to use my metaphor of the sailboat, to really go out you know, to the deep dark blue, to, as Brene Brown puts it, dare greatly, because we, we have confidence in ourselves. Equanimity gives us confidence to you know, ride the river, uh, as they say, I think, in some Western novels. Anyway, and so equanimity enables us to be engaged with life. It is engaged uh, deep in the insights that also foster equanimity is a sense of interdependence, interbeing, as Thich Nhat Hanh puts it, so that we recognize our dependencies in equanimity. We, we, that's one way to understand as well upsets and issues of various kinds. We realize that they are interdependently arising. They are made up of many parts, they have a certain dynamism to them, a certain impermanence often, and um, they're there. I mean, equanimity is aware of all that, certainly, so it's engaged inherently in life. And equanimity is adaptive. It helps us say this and not say that. It helps us take some time to form a response uh, to something that's happened without just going off half-cocked, as it were. And so then when we do respond, when we do adapt, we do so much more effectively. Okay, I want to move to an end in my formal presentation here. So there's time for some questions and discussion. Uh, in your cultivation of equanimity to finish, I would just like to highlight attention to spaciousness. Second, real-time awareness of a kind of space between whether something is pleasant or unpleasant or heartfelt, uh, relational, let's say, or neutral even, and then what follows. This is core to the Buddhist teachings of mindfulness, of the hedonic tone of experiences, often translated as the feeling tone of experiences. Be aware of you know, what happens after you like something. Do you need to move to, into wanting it? Be aware of what happens after you dislike something. Do you have to move into aversion toward it? Be aware of what happens after there's a sense of relationality. Can you simply abide with it? Or do you need to move into some form of clinging, like trying to impress others or get certain social supplies or narcissistic supplies from them. That awareness right there of the movement from the hedonic tone into perhaps craving and clinging, be aware of that and see if increasingly you can rest in liking without wanting, disliking without aversion. Very useful. Also deliberately cultivating. When it's authentic for you, often very mild experiences, even fairly brief ones, of peacefulness, one kind or another, such as calm strength, a sense of contentment, of one kind or another, such as thankfulness and gratitude, and cultivating a sense of warm-heartedness, lovingness, uh, flowing out or received and flowing in. That also will be a major factor for you.
of equanimity. Okay. So questions, comments? Uh, let, the, let the wild rumpus begin. Okay. So I see questions, comments coming in. Lots to say here. I'm seeing nice comments. Nothing in particular for me to speak to. Let's see. Okay. Rick, there was a huh? question about pain. From how to handle pain. You mean in the moment? Well, yeah. when you're fostering equanimity. With yeah, physical pain. Problems. Yeah, I'll happily speak to that. So, yeah. Um, oh, and then I see a very interesting and important question from Evelyn with a wonderful last name there at 7.19 p.m. Um, so first, pain. Uh, I have family members who deal with chronic pain, um, mainly mild, sometimes more than mild. Uh, I have a friend, uh, Vidyamala Birch, B-U-R-C-H, who deals with quite intense chronic pain. There's a lot of uh, thoughtfulness about how to practice with pain. I'm not an expert on this, but I will say that um, to kind of summarize a lot of teaching about it, one way of dealing with it has to do with kind of going into the pain, not resisting it, opening to it, being with it in a field of spaciousness. There is pain experienced and as spacious a field as possible. There's a lot about this approach that was at the heart of the development of mindfulness-based stress reduction. John Kabat-Zinn's just incredibly great contribution. Uh, and so, uh, you know, that, and people talk about that. And when you, when you stop fighting with it, you're, you're more, it's, it doesn't somehow seem so horrible and a person can be less identified with it. There's this key distinction, as the Buddha said, between the first dart of life and the second dart or the first pleasure and the second, you know, grasping after it. In other words, there is pain, there is pain. And we wouldn't wish it for others. We wouldn't wish it for ourselves. It's real. There is pain. It's unfortunate. But do we need to add second dart reactions to the pain of, of sadness or anger at others or blaming oneself or despair? Uh, Vidyamala talks about being in the hospital in excruciating pain as a young woman, early 20s after an operation, and feeling enormous despair about the life she was going to have ahead of her. How could she possibly stand it? And she suddenly realized um, in, a, in a penetrating breakthrough experience of mindfulness that she didn't have to deal with pain in all her life. She just had to deal with it in the present, in this breath, in this moment. And she could do that. And with that realization was, was, was a tremendous breakthrough for her. So that's one aspect of it. Second, I would say, is the importance identified in research and elsewhere of establishing research resources alongside the pain. In other words, to looking for the capacity to focus on what is not pain, the capacity to recognize pleasure, beauty, love, to recognize good qualities in oneself, really important, uh, to recognize um, the field of awareness, which is it not itself pain. You know, the field of awareness um, represents what passes through it, but is not itself what passes through it. Uh, and so awareness itself is not in pain. It contains pain, but awareness itself is not pained. And abiding as awareness can be a real refuge here. So there's a growing of resources of various kinds, including the sense of others who care about one, who love one, um, to put it in a very deliberately technical way. Social support is, um, you know, reduces pain. It, it's analgesic, uh, uh, research shows. So bringing in the felt sense of others and dropping into your own good heart can also help to deal with pain. So we have these two major practices kind of strategically. I'll steer, you know, clear of specific tactics, because I'm not an expert on this, but strategically there's the practice of opening to the pain and in fact going into it sometimes, sort of exploring it in detail, okay? 
and also the practices that are growing uh, resources alongside it. I encourage you to check out Vidyamala's Breathworks trainings, uh, as well as other great teachers who focus on managing pain or illness broadly, such as Tony Bernhardt. Uh, I think one of her books is titled How to Be Sick, uh, and she writes from personal experience. So that's what I would say about that. And then I want to talk about addressing what well, could be called maybe a different kind of pain. Um, let's see, I want to go roll back up to something about outrage at, here we go, from Evelyn. Evelyn with the great last name, Hansen. I find that outrage motivates me to take action, for instance, for social justice and climate activism. Please address. Yeah. And I want to just go back and speak to a question that came in. Someone was asking me, what was the third thing that I mentioned that's helpful in supporting equanimity? Um, I was talking about first um, practicing with spaciousness, you know, recognizing it, cultivating it, um, helping yourself, like literally looking up from what's compelling your attention, you know, near to you, which tends to really reactivate us and focusing more on what's a little more distant and less invasive. So that's as one example of spaciousness. Second was, the, was um, focusing on the kind of buffer or distance between oneself and the hedonic tones of experiences so that over time we can like without wanting, without grasping, without getting driven or addictive about something. We can enjoy it as it passes on through and we can dislike, we, we can be worried about it. We can be, you know, outraged by it without getting caught up in or come into hatred of it or ill will toward it or being panicked or frozen or terrified of it. Right? That buffer in there is really supported by mindfulness of the hedonic tone of experiences and what follows after them. And deliberately doing practices where you be with what is unpleasant without moving into aversion for it. That doesn't mean holding the same posture in your chair for 45 minutes and ending up with permanent back damage to your back as sometimes might happen. No, I mean, be adaptive and so forth. But if it's just there and you know, see what it's like to not like it, but not be bothered by it. Also see what it's like to enjoy something without needing a second helping or a second glass uh, and uh, see what that's like. That was my second suggestion. And then third, the cultivation again and again and again of the felt sense of needs met enough in the moment so that there's no actual basis for craving, really. And you can be rested in a felt sense of peacefulness, contentment, and love. Okay, that's what I said. So with regard to, uh, where are we here? Evelyn, right, going up. The thing about you know being mobilized to take effective action. This is where equanimity, and our, I, that's why I said our, the, the part, in part, about equanimity being engaged and adaptive. We, we are engaged. And it's really interesting, uh, and sometimes a subtle art, to use first darts. Use those reactions of fear or outrage or, or moral condemnation, moral disgust at, at other people sometimes or other kinds of things or alarm at what might be coming your way to then use that to mobilize or to use it as fuel for skillful, sustained, effective, energetic action toward something good, toward a better place, toward solving that problem, toward getting out of that burning building, toward getting your kids away from the oncoming bus, to moving it into action. And it's a real interesting territory that I think is very relevant for people living a householder life, people, you know, certainly monastics as well, but uh, I think particularly householders, and also people who are engaged in social justice work or trying to help the world one way or another, including, the most basic level of trying to get a stop sign you know, <laughs> down at the end of your street, let's say. You know, it's really interesting territory. How do we draw upon and be mobilized by and, and, and use these feelings, let's say, that are not so serene, they're not very tranquil, they're pretty intense sometimes. How can we use these feelings to 
focus attention on problems and issues, injustice? Uh, and how can we use these feelings to energize us, especially if we're somebody who's been squelched and under the thumb or belongs to a group of people that's been historically squelched in terrible ways and oppressed and mistreated in horrific ways sometimes. It's really, how do we use you know, this to energize ourselves for the greater good, for, you know, as John Lewis put it, I believe, good trouble. So really interesting. How do we do that without tipping into hating the other and demonizing them? and regarding them as an it rather than, an a, than a thou. That's an ongoing practice, and one of the things that really serves it, as I will finish up here, is real-time mindfulness of your own reactions. Also, having a kind of jaundiced view of your own mind, where you realize how rapidly you can get caught up in righteousness, demonization, othering of others, we're vulnerable as tribal beings who have spent almost all of our evolutionary history, certainly as primates, including as hominids, and most of our time as anatomically modern humans. We spent most of our time living in small bands that cooperated with us, but much of the time feared and aggressed upon them. So we're really vulnerable, especially if we're being manipulated by authoritarian demagogues of one stripe or another who are playing on grievances to develop their own you know, wealth and power. Um, we're vulnerable to getting caught up in those reactions. So it's helpful to have a kind of jaundiced view of yourself. Um, and it's helpful to know what it feels like to live in that sweet spot where you're calm in your core, you're at peace in your core while discerning clearly and knowing what you value and knowing what you are going to do. And as the Buddha taught in one of my favorite uh, little sayings of his, uh, that one is wise truly, not just because you, you know, one is truly wise who is peaceable, friendly, and fearless. You know what that feels like? What, what's the feeling of it in the body? The somatic markers of that sweet spot of dignity, self-respect, uncowed and unbowed without hating the enemy, without being invaded by enemy images that occupy the mind and remain. That's really a process of cultivation. Well, I think we all have our work cut out uh, in terms of equanimity. Uh, it's one of the seven factors of awakening in the Buddhist tradition. It's the one typically listed last because it can be the, you know, it, it, there's the richest and longest path of cultivating it. Um, you know, in the present time, certainly I'm still working on my own equanimity and it's far from perfect. Uh, how about we take a last minute here just to kind of be with each other, let whatever you have found beneficial to sink in, coming to rest. Remembering that it does, it's not a violation of equanimity to have reactions flowing through. Equanimity is not the end of reactions. Equanimity is not reacting to our reactions. That's the essence of equanimity. Which is wonderful because it means we can be our, our authentic self. And in equanimity, we can find a fundamental and far-reaching inner freedom. So thank you for your attention and thank you for your practice. Thank you for your own development of equanimity, greater equanimity, which serves all of us and in ways seen and unseen, known and unknown, I'm sure of it, uh, benefits me as well. So thank you very much and it's a wrap.